So I'd like to, I'd like to open up um, this morning with a scripture verse. And I don't know if, uh, Sharon, were you able to get those on there or how'd that go? I showed up late this morning, so I didn't give her much forewarning and pulling these all up. <clears throat> um, Acts chapter 19 and verse 13 to 17. And what I want to talk on this morning, this scripture verse actually has nothing to do with my talk. But it actually has everything to do with my talk. So here we go. Uh, it said, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon themselves to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord. Jesus, the Lord Jesus, <laughs> saying, we adjure you, in other words, we command you, by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And, that, and there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. You know, I want, what I want for you guys this morning, what I want for myself, is I want the devils to know our name. I want them to know who we are. And that's, that's my cry. That's, that's my heart. And that's, I'm not saying that because we need to have recognition. We don't need to, you know, um, to be in control, to be in charge. You know what I'm saying? Like Jesus said, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. But God has a work for each one of us to do. You know, it said Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And the Lord wants us to be destroying the works of the devil this morning. And there's stuff sometimes that gets in the way of us doing and walking that. And what I wanted to talk about this morning was a recipe for triumph over sorrow. You know, a lot of God's people walk around with sorrow in their hearts, with grief in their hearts, and we all do, right, to some extent, some level. There's, there's always stuff going on that, that comes in our lives. But, you know, God doesn't want us to continue on in that. He doesn't want us to get stuck in that. And um, a couple of weeks ago, I came home, and... Um, <clears throat> Noah and Dustin, my two boys, were out playing in the sandbox. And so I went over and I said to them, hey, Noah, hey, Dustin, how are you guys doing? And they kept playing away, no answer. And I said, hey, guys, what are you doing? No answer. I said again, hey, Noah and Dustin, what are you guys building? No answer. They just kept playing with each other. And I, I just, I kind of walked away from that moment. And I thought, man, am I, like, Am I not connecting with my kids? Like, you know, and, and I got really, I got really down. I got really bummed out about it for a couple of days. And, and, um, and it wasn't just that incident. It was kind of some other things. You know, you start thinking about other things. And, and I just give you this example. This, this is how things happen in our life. This is how, you know, we start taking stuff on. And um, so anyways, yeah, that later the one night, I kind of said to Anita, I said, yeah, I said, I've been really really discouraged the last couple of days and just struggling with stuff. And she says, yeah, I know, I can, I can tell. She said, uh, so what's your problem? So this is my precious wife. She doesn't pull any punches. What's your problem? <laughs> you know, but we all, we all have a problem, right? We, we all have struggles. We all, we all have stuff that we're going through. And the thing that I love about David, and, and he's the guy I want to kind of turn to and look to, is he knew how to overcome sorrow. He, he knew how to overcome, you know, when things come upon you and, and you're dealing with stuff in your life. And um, were you able to pull them up? Um, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. It said, David was greatly distressed. Now, this, this, was after, this came after a time when uh, David and all his men, they were kind of away. They kind of left their stuff behind and their wives and their possessions and their children. And... In the meantime, while they were gone away doing something else, uh, the Ammonites came along, 
or the uh, Amalekites, and took all their stuff, took their wives, took their children, and so all the all the men here that were with him in his army really upset at him, and they're thinking, let's get rid of this, let's stone David, you know, you know he's he's kind of lost it as a leader, and I'm not going to follow him anymore. And it said, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You know, that is so awesome. We need to learn how to encourage ourselves in God. And, you know, it's a great place. You know, oftentimes after the ministry of the word, we say, uh, you know, if you want to come up for ministry, and that, that the altar is open, you know, come and, and there'll be people here to pray with you. And that's awesome. We want to do that. And, and we may even do that today, you know, just open that up. But there's this place, too, where God wants us to, you know, to learn how to encourage ourselves in the Lord. And I, and, and I don't say if you're coming up or anything today or any other day that, um, that you're blown or you're not at where you should be because we all need each other. But there's this place about learning to encourage ourselves in God and get strong in God. And in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, there's a recipe here. And I, and I kind of come across this a few months back. And I just thought it was really awesome. It was just really neat. just kind of really stood out to me. And 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, verse 20. David has, um, before I begin reading this, David has fallen into sin with Bathsheba. She's gotten pregnant. He's killed her husband, and he's taken her as his own wife. And then Nathan the prophet comes to him and speaks and says, you know, you, you've given great occasion to the enemy to blaspheme my name. And he said, so the child that is born to you is going to die. And so David, you know, he begins to fast and pray and, and cry out to God. And then the child dies. And, you know, his servants are trying to get him up. And he won't, you know, he refuses to eat. He refuses to get out from, from prayer and from fasting. And so then he dies, and they're afraid to tell him that he's died. But, you know, he, David notices them whispering, so he perceives that's what's happened. He says, has the child died? And he says, yes. They said, yes. So then David, it says, David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself, changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he ate. You know, there's just some excellent steps here in, that we find here in David in, in what he did and responded. But we're just going to finish the story. They said, his servants said to him, what is this that you've done? He said, you fasted and you wept for the child. Well, it was alive, but when the child is dead, you rise up and you eat bread. And he said, well, the child was yet alive. I fasted and I wept for I said, who can tell whether the Lord God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So we see here that David, he got up from the ground. There was, there was six things here that David did that helped him to break free from this place of sorrow that he was in, this grief that he was dealing with, with the situation that he was, that he was in. And, and originally, I was only going to say five. I wasn't going to say the first one, but um, I realized how important it is. But the first thing David did is it said that he got up. He rose up from the ground. And you know, movement is so critical to beginning the process when you don't know what to do, when, you, when you're uh, in a place of uh, that wrestle, that struggle with sorrow, um, or something you're grieving over, or a situation that you just, uh, the situation isn't changing, right? The situation didn't change for David. He, he sought God on it, and uh, 
but it, it wasn't changing. He was just grieving and mourning. But you just have to get up, and that's the beginning of just starting the process. None of the other things um, are going to happen unless we just get up and begin moving. And, you know, for me sometimes, uh, and especially the last little while, things have been just so busy uh, with farm life and, and that sort of thing, and of course, raising children, um, that I've, I've just, in the mornings, I've just laid there in bed and done my prayer time with the Lord, you know? And that's okay. That's okay at times, you know? I mean, um, there's a place where David in the psalm says, you know, worship the Lord in your beds, you know, and, and glorify his name. But there's just, there was just this thing in me about, you know, after a while, the Lord was just saying, you need to get up, Peter. You just, you need to get up. And, and so I, I started doing that again, you know, and it just, it just brings um, more unction, you know, just, just more life to what you're doing. And, and you're coming and you're meeting with the Lord. And in Acts chapter 16 and verse 6 to 10, um, Paul and those who are traveling with him, you know, they're called of God to go out and uh, to begin to, to go and to minister to people. And they know they have this calling on their life, but they're not sure, you know, where they're supposed to be going. And it said, it says, when they had gone throughout... Um, Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were, they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come to uh, Masia, they state they essayed to go into Bithynia. I'm not used to this um, King James version, sorry. <laughs> uh, but the Spirit suffered them not, and they passing by Masia came to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed to him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for us to preach the gospel to them. So the, the cool thing that I love about this verse is, is Paul just started making movement. He, he, went, he tried to go one place and said the Spirit of the Lord would not permit them. They tried to go somewhere else to preach the word and to minister the gospel, and it said the Spirit of the Lord would not permit them. And then all of a sudden, he, he, you know, he has this, this dream, this vision in the night of this man from Macedonia. And so then clarity begins to come. And that's the way it is with us, too. It's just like you've got to just get up. You know, you just got to bust a move, right? And... and just start the process, and God will begin to bring clarity. God will begin to unfold what you need to do. And so I just want you to remember this today, and I, and I can't be outdone by Pastor Travis, like, <clears throat> like giving space for grace, put pride aside. So this morning, I want you to remember to bust a move, get back in the groove, okay? Because if you're going to break sorrow off your life, that's what you have to do. You, you have to start that process. Just get up and start moving and let, let God bring clarity. So after David rose up from the ground, it said he washed himself. So the second thing we need to do is get washed. And in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26, um, talking about the Lord and, and his church, it said that he might sanctify the church and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. So what David's doing here in the natural is, is just unfolding spiritual principles, spiritual truths for us, because washing for us um, in our spirit, right, and in our soul is the word. You know, we need to come to the word. We need to get washed by the water of the word, you, to, to begin breaking the sorrow and, and the grief and getting beyond it, getting past it. Uh, you know, we need to get washed. We need to come and back and get in the word. And when you, when you choose in, in your own life to wash right in the natural, you choose clean water, right? You're not going to use dirty water. And that's why we come to the word of God, because it's clean. I don't go to the Quran. I don't go to the eightfold path of, 
enlightenment of the Hindus. You know, I go to the Word of God because I know I can trust the Word. I know the things that God reveals to you and me in the Word is going to bring a washing, uh, a good washing in my spirit. Entertainment. You know, some people, too, they'll, they'll use entertainment to try and, and, and wash away their sorrow. And, and I'm not against entertainment. I mean, there's, there's good entertainment. And basically, all I'll say in that regard is just choose well. You know, it, it, it's good sometimes just to find some relief and some entertainment. But choose well because there's so much stuff out there that's not. You know, and, and there's been times where I've started to watch a movie and you just, after you kind of get into it, oh, it's not that great, you know, I should, I should shut this thing down and just walk away. And, and there's been times where I haven't, you know, I've done it or maybe I paid money to go to a movie that I thought was going to be half decent. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it wasn't that great and I should have got up and, and walked out for the sake of all that my money was really worth <laughs> putting towards it, you know. And afterwards, it just felt crummy because I didn't, I didn't. I didn't act on that, and I didn't walk out. And, you know, if we choose entertainment like that to try and wash away sorrow, you're only going to scrub all the harder to try and get washed off, to try and get cleaned. So, so choose well. Um, the next thing David did was he went and he got anointed. You know, he says he washed himself, and then he anointed himself. And, you know, many of us know what it is uh, to get washed, you know, to feel clean again, to get refreshed. But not too many of us know what it is to get anointed, you know, which is the Spirit of God. And there's, there's so many facets to the anointing. Um, and, and that's a whole study in itself. So I, I don't really want to get into all that. But, you know, there's, there's, the, there's the anointing, the oil of joy. There's, there's the anointing for um, healing the brokenhearted. There's the anointing for... Uh, restoring the sight of the blind. There's anointing for setting the captives free and preaching the gospel. There's an anointing that comes in many different, di many different ways and many different levels. But the main thing is just, I just want to say just basically this morning, just seek to get that anointing in God, which is, which is that unction of the Spirit of God speaking in your life. And, you know, a lot of us, uh, we, it's too easy to live in this place where the paths meet. And in Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 1 to 6, it says, Does not wisdom cry out and understanding lift up her voice? She takes her stand at the top of the high hill beside the way where the paths meet. She cries out by the gates at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the doors, to you, O man, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O oh, you simple ones, understand prudence, and you fools, be of an understanding heart. Listen, for I will speak of excellent things, and from the opening of my lips will come right things. So wisdom cries out at the place where the paths meet. You know, that place, and that's, I just want to say, you know, in a sense, that's the place where you get washed, right? You... You get on that place where um, you get washed, you get cleansed from that place that you were at. You get on the right path, but you're still kind of right there where the paths meet. And God wants us to move beyond the place where the paths meet. He wants us to understand the anointing. He wants us to understand his unction, you know, where he's speaking to your heart. And um, there was one time, this was years ago, of course, because I'm a married man now, but I was kind of in this relationship with this girl, and I, I, I started backing away from it. I just, I didn't feel, you know, the peace of God. I just didn't feel that unction of the Spirit to continue on in this relationship. And, and I was struggling with it, and, and one day my dad came to me, and he said, you know, Peter, you need to, like, think twice about this and of course I was already I don't know what it was late 30s um, somewhere in there and so I was getting along in years and of course my dad wants to see me married like like any good parent would 
And he said, listen, you just, you need to think about this twice, and, and I think you need to go and, and pursue this relationship and, and do it. You know, she's a good Christian woman. Just go ahead, do it, get married. And, and I, I just said to him, I said, Dad, I said, I know that. I realize that. You know, she's, she seems like a nice girl. I don't understand. But I said, if I have ever um, understood or heard the voice of God, I said, then it's now. I said, because if, if, I, if I'm not hearing right now, I've never heard. I've never understood. It was just, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it was just, I just knew, you know, this choice that I had to make. It's just this leading of the spirit that I had to learn to follow. And, and so I did. And, and that's what God wants all of us to do is to allow the anointing, allow the spirit of God. You know, after there's been that washing and that cleansing, learning how to walk in the spirit, learning how to respond to the spirit of God so we can be in step with the drumbeat, you know, and move on in this place that God has for us. So, you got a bus to move, get back in the groove. You got to get washed. You got to get anointed. And, um, and yeah, I just want to add to this too, this anointing. In Exodus chapter 30 and verse 37, um, there was an, anoint, an anointing oil that was developed uh, that God gave to Moses for the anointing of Aaron and his sons and for the priesthood. And he says to them here, he said, But as for the incense which you shall make, you shall not make any for yourselves. According to its composition, it shall be to you holy for the Lord. We're not supposed to use the anointing of God for our, for our own personal lives. You'll be blessed by walking in the anointing, and people around you will be blessed by it, but we're not supposed to use it for personal gain. And we won't go to the scripture verse, but in 2 Kings in chapter 5, there's this time when uh, Elijah, um, he has a servant called Gehazi, and Naaman comes to him to get healed. So this is uh, Elisha. And Naaman comes to him, and he has leprosy. And Naaman, or sorry, Elisha tells Naaman what to do to go dip seven times in the Jordan River and get cleansed, get healed from his leprosy. And so he does that, kind of reluctantly at first, but he does it, gets healed. And then, you know, Naaman wants to bless Elisha with his, all his personal possessions and goods and stuff. And he says, no, he says, I'm not going to, you know, receive anything from your hand for this. And so, and so Naaman leaves and goes back to his own country. He was from another country. And Elisha's servant, Gehazi, he says, well, my master, he shouldn't have done this. So he goes after, you know, this guy and says, hey, listen, uh, my master changed his mind. He's had somebody come and visit him, and he needs some clothing, and he needs some talents of silver. You know, can you give us a couple? And, of course, Naaman <clears throat> unknowingly goes ahead and gives it to him. And so in the end, Elisha says, you know, he said to him, where have you been? What have you done? And Gehazi tries to hide it. He says, you know, is this a time, you know, to receive um, these things from this man. And he says, now, he says, the leprosy of Naaman and his house will cling to you and to your house. And so we're not supposed to use, just the basis of that story is just, there's, we're not supposed to use the anointing of God and the things that he's given us for our own personal gain. So we want to walk in that anointing of God, amen? And, and we, just, we just want to learn to listen and respond to his voice. And, and just stay in touch, stay in tune with God. The next thing David did was he got changed. <clears throat> he changed his apparel. He changed his clothes. And, you know, it's no good to get washed and to get anointed and then put the same dirty clothes back on. And... <clears throat> um, you know, because, because the clothes are, are carrying, you know, all of our sweat and all the dirt that came off our bodies, that came off the environment that we were in. And this morning, you know, after, 
I came back from the farm and got out of the shower and put my aftershave on and all that, you would not appreciate it if I put my farm clothes back on and came in here because most of you would be smelling me from back there. Amen? So, and we don't want to do that in the spirit. We don't want to do that in the natural either. We need to change our clothes. And um, during the encounter time, for those of you who've been in the encounter, uh, Pastor Travis just does an excellent job of one of our sessions where he talks about changing our garments. And uh, one of the scripture verses he has there is Colossians chapter 3, verse 8 to 10 that we'll read. <clears throat> but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. And 1 Peter 5, and uh, 5, I think it is. In the same way, you younger men must accept the authority of the elders, and all of you serve each other in humility, for God opposes the proud, but gives favor to the humble. So he's talking about being clothed there, you know, serving each other in humility, being clothed with humility. So we need to put off the anger. We need to put off. So humility and, and the virtues, those good things um, that God wants us to put on, those, those are virtues um, that God wants us to put on. But the thing is, is these virtues have to do with how we associate with other people. It has to do with how we have relationships with each other. And, you know, what is, what is a virtue if there's nobody around to express it to? What is a virtue if there's nobody around us that brings that expression out? And, you know, there's a lot of virtues for those of you who've been married, raised children. Um, you've gained a lot of virtues, or at least hopefully you've gained a lot of virtues through the things that you go through in, in your association, your walk with people. So getting virtues, getting these, putting on these, this clothing of humility and, and kindness and, and goodness and patience, um, these are virtues that are to become our clothing in the way that we relate to each other. So we don't want to get washed, we don't want to get anointed, and then still keep treating each other in a way that gives off such a stench, right? Such a smell. Um, God wants us to change our clothes. Um, and that's why in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 24 to 25, We're exhorted here, don't befriend an angry, uh, don't befriend angry people or associate with hot-tempered people, or you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. So, again, this is all has to do about an associating, the way we associate with other people. That's why we have to, you know, choose our relationships wisely, because we can end up putting on a clothing that God doesn't want us to put on because of our association with that person, because of the time, you know, um, unwise time that we spend with somebody else. Have you ever been to a function where people want you to notice what they're wearing? You know, you've probably all been through that, you know, and, 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 and I'm sure you do and I do too. I like person, a person that's well-dressed. But you know what it is kind of when you, you know, sometimes you go to these functions like everybody's like dulled right up to the nines and it's, there's just this element of, hey, look at me. You know, trying to draw attention to yourself. And the purpose of us changing our clothes is, is not for drawing attention to ourselves. It's not... You know, we're not seeking God to gain patience or to gain these virtues. 
uh, that God wants us to put on so that we can say, hey, look at me, you know, look at, look at the threads that I'm wearing in God, you know, because sometimes we can do that. Sometimes we have a tendency to try and get people to notice us by the things that we think that we're pursuing in God or we're asking God for, but we're really doing it to try and draw attention to ourselves. And God says, no, I want you to clothe yourself with these things because they're drawing attention to me. You know, they're, they're here to bring glory to me. And as a result of him getting the glory, we're blessed and people around us are blessed. Amen? So let's get changed. Let's bust a move, get back in the groove. Let's get washed. Let's get anointed. Let's get changed. And then let's get our worship on. It said that David, he came into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. And in um, Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, I really, I really like this little tidbit of truth that, that comes out. Um, but Jesus here, he's going through, this is a time he's going through the temptation in the desert. He's been fasting and, and seeking God for 40 days. And the devil comes to him, and it says he took him to the peak of a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory, and he said, I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Why did he say to kneel down and worship me? Because even the devil knows that worship is, has to be expressive. You have to express worship. And that's the thing that, you know, I want us to get here this morning, too, is that when we come to worship God, let it be expressive. It needs to be expressive. You know, I know we all come from different backgrounds. We come from a place, some of us, you know, where uh, we're used to being very reserved. Maybe you grew up in a traditional church. Yep, that's where I came from, you know. But, but God wants to break that off of us, you know, and he wants us to learn to be expressive because it brings victory. It helps you bring uh, that triumph over that sorrow and over that grief, you know, as you learn to come and, and to worship and to be expressive in your worship. Um, it was during this time, you know, when David is, is fasting and, and praying for this child and his whole fall into sin with Bathsheba that David wrote Psalm 51. And we won't go there, but, um, you know, it's a time when he read it where he, he wrote Psalm 51, and you may be familiar with some of the, the choruses we sing. Um, Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. You know, cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And what I want us to capture out of this is just simply, you know, worship needs to be personal, and it needs to be creative. You know, when we come, whether it's here this morning when we're worshiping, whether it's at home, um, don't just sing everybody else's songs. And that's great. I mean, that's, that's, that's helpful. That can be helpful as a lead-in, right? But there comes a time, and, and that was excellent, like Bianca this morning, where she just kind of left that space for us to come and just give your own voice, you know, that own creativity. What, what do you want to say to God? in your worship personally? What, what do you want to bring to him in your offering? You know, and so worship needs to be expressive. It needs to be personal. It needs to be creative. I know you're not, uh, you don't necessarily look at yourself as being a songwriter, but, and nobody's expecting that in that sense of you personally, but there is an element where you do need to write your own song personally. It might not come out. Nobody's going to maybe produce a CD for you. You might not step into that place. If you do, you know, praise God, that's awesome. But still, it needs to be personal. It needs to be uh, expressive and creative in, in your own place, in your own right. I remember one time, um, <clears throat> uh, Art and Carol, you may remember the uh, McMurray's used to come here and they ended up moving back Colberg way but they were here and and I always 
I really enjoy one day I was, I was sitting at back and, and Art was up a couple um, rows from me and there was a time where, where there was this creative time where we could just worship ourselves, and Art was just entering in and, and, and worshiping, but he was so off key <laughs> that it didn't match anything of <clears throat> what the worship team was leading with. It was, it was just off key and everything, but you know what? I loved it because I could just tell it was so heartfelt. It was so um, coming from himself in his own creativity. He was just entering in and, and just giving it. And so in your own creativity, you don't have to worry about whether it's off key or not. You know, you're probably, it, it, you know, if that's, if that's your weakness, you're probably not going to get asked to be a worship leader. But, but just give it, you know, just give it to God. It's, it's, it's being offered up to him. And, you know, the Lord just wants us to, to learn to be free in that. And, uh, and, yeah, it was awesome this morning about, you know, I'm free to run. I'm free to dance this morning, right? I'm free to worship him. And, and that's where God wants us to come into in our worship. So we want you to get your worship on. And then lastly, it said after David was at the house of the Lord, it said then he went back to his own home. And when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. You know, again, coming back to the Word of God, we need the Word to be strengthened. And the interesting thing here is the Word not only is to bring cleansing in your life, but it's also to make you strong. And sometimes we would do well when we come to the Word to say, you know, am I in a place right now where I need to get washed? Lord, do I... Is, you know, do I, I, is there something that needs to be washed off my life, off my spirit? Or is there something I need strength for? And so the word brings both that cleansing and strength. And the interesting thing is, you know, why, why, would, why would we, why do we eat again? Right? Well, because there's a war to be fought. We need to get strong again. We need to get back in. Um, back into the game, right? There's, there's a time here, you know, with David, he was fasting and he was praying, he was seeking God, and he was weeping dur during that time. He was going through this, this sorrow and this grief, but he understood what it, what it, what it meant to, to bring it to an end, you know, and to end that time. And because he had things that he had to carry on, he had to move on in, and sometimes with us, you know, we can, we can get stuck in things, you know, and, and kind of coming back to, you know, the story I shared about with my kids, you know, it, it's, it, it wasn't really wrong of me to, to kind of go through a period of time where I was questioning, you know, am I doing this right with my kids? Am I, am I connecting with them? You know, that's okay. It's okay in our life to question those things and, and, and you have this time of, of kind of grieving and questioning and, and, and walking through that to see if I'm in the place that I should be in. But God doesn't want you to get stuck in that place. He doesn't want me to get stuck in that place. And so that's, and that's the place, too, where you need to understand the timing. There's time to bring this to an end. There's a time for me to move back. There's things I need to carry on with doing. And uh, as we kind of started out, you know, in the beginning, you know, we're, we're in a war. You know, there's a war to be fought, and you need strength uh, for that war. And uh, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 14. Uh, John writing here, he says, I've written to you who are God's children because you know the Father, and I've written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I've written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts, and you have won the battle with the evil one, right? So we need that word. We need that word of God to abide in us so that we're strong, you know, so that we can fight against the enemy. We've got to get back into the war, you know, back into the game of fighting off the enemy.
Um, so yeah, just, it's just in conclusion then, <clears throat> um, I just wanna say, you know, the importance, again, of getting washed. You know, let's get back up, you know, get in the groove, you know, bust a move, get back in the groove, and get washed, get anointed, change your clothes, come in and, and worship God, seek the Lord, and eat and get strengthened. And in, in all this, in overcoming the, any grief, any sorrow, uh, stuff that you deal with in your life that the enemy tries and purposes to bring you down in, but God is using to prepare you for that next step, that next place that you're coming to. And when we're going through times of grief in our life, and just to close with this, is that it's easy for us to get thinking about ourselves. It's easy for us to get focused on ourselves. And the best way, you know, is getting in this process where we break these things off. And I heard this thing the other day, and, and I, I just loved it. And you've probably said this to other people, or especially if you've raised kids before, um, about, you know, there's always somebody that's worse off than you. I, I say this to, we said this to our kids, you know, kids, you need to eat what's on your plate because there's other people in the world that don't have anything to eat, you know, and they're, they're complaining about, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to eat this or they don't like this, right? And we say that, but I heard this thing the other day and this um, person was saying about how when they were growing up, how their mom used to say to them, um, you know, I, I know it's really hard for you. I know you're going through a tough time, but you know, there's other people worse off than you. So you need to go find that person and make their day. And I just loved that second element of that truth, you know, about not just realizing that there's other people that have it worse off than, than us or they're going through a hard time, but let's go find those people. Let's go make their day because that's going to help us to take all the thinking off ourselves and all the stuff that we're going through and all the grieving uh, that we might be dealing with and help you to break that thing off and help you to move on in God and help you to be a blessing, you know, to other people. So this morning, you know, I just want to encourage you, you know, let's just bust a move and get back in the groove. Let's just, just begin that process. If, you know, if you're struggling, if you're wrestling with something, and um, maybe the worship team, can you just come back up? Is Bianca here? Oh, she's not? Okay. Maybe we can just put some... Okay, sure. Yeah, come on up, Jonah. And so, yeah, we just want to open it up this morning. If, um, if you want to come up, if there's something that you're dealing with or just something you've been struggling with and you've just been finding it hard to just move ahead in that, just get free from that, um, Pastor Jacques, Marilyn, you know, if you guys want to come up too and you just pray for people, if you want to come up, if you want prayer for something this morning. But uh, otherwise, this morning, you're, we just uh, bless you and uh, release you to go and just have some great time of fellowship with one another. So, Father, we just thank you this morning. We just, we just bless you. We thank you that, Lord, you always have a good thing that you're doing, that you're working in our lives. And we thank you, Father God, for the process that you have that that liberates us, that, that brings us, God, through this time where in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our wrestle, God, you are always bringing out good things. And, and thank you, God, that we can get up in your name. Thank you, Lord God, that we can get washed by your word. Thank you this morning that there's an anointing by your spirit, that you come to help us. You don't leave us in this process uh, to try and do it by ourselves. And Lord, just thank you that um, we can come and just change our clothes, God. You have new clothing for us. And, and so, Lord, we just we want to take on that new clothing that you have for us. So, Lord, just thank you we can come and worship you. And we worship you this morning, Lord. We, we just come and we bless your great name. And, Father, we thank you for your word that strengthens us, that makes us strong to continue on 
in the battle. And Lord, my prayer this morning for your people is that wherever they are in the process, that you would just meet them, that they would be encouraged to know that, God, you are working in them, that the devils will know their name. Lord, whether they cast uh, unclean spirits out of others or whether, God, it's just breaking the, the, the um, work of the enemy over their own lives that's trying to pull them down, that's trying to drag them down. Lord, we just thank you this morning, Lord, that you are at work in your people. Lord, we just thank you and bless you. Thank you for your great love in Jesus' name. Amen.